An emotional return to school for students who survived a nightmare. Children who once attended Robb Elementary School now back in class for a new school year. Three other elementary schools in the Uvalde School District take them in. Tonight, the parents who are choosing to keep their children at home and the beefed up security measures for those going back in person. There was a question of whether I was mentally ready, but not to go back. Teaching was always something I wanted to do, and I know that Tess would have wanted me to go back. Pain, loss, grief, and devastation. Our David Muir travels to Bucha, Ukraine, where Russian forces are accused of atrocious war crimes and the massacre of countless civilians. And the latest in the country's counteroffensive from Martha Raddatz and Mary Bruce in Washington. A major hit for Juul, a settlement after a major youth marketing probe. A multi-million dollar payout from the company, which is not acknowledging any wrongdoing in the settlement. A heartbreaking discovery in the search for a kidnapped teacher. The body is found of the mother of two who was grabbed while jogging. What we know about the man accused of killing her and the surveillance video that shows the two together. And they've had a career that spans decades and solidified themselves as an enduring jam band. Our Phil Lipoff talks with jam band OAR about finding new fans, hanging on to the old ones, and life on the road with growing families. It's really tough to answer those questions. When and you're coming home from work? Yeah, like why, why do you have to go play shows? Can I come? Why can't I come? Those are the tough questions. Welcome back. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin this Tuesday night after Labor Day with the latest round of students now returning to school. In Uvalde, it's back to a difficult reality for students who spent the summer trying to move past the horror that they endured in May, still trying to cope with the lingering grief. Fifth grader Gemma Lopez was in the classroom right next door. She waited for the school bus this morning, promising herself, I'm going to get through this day. Rob Elementary will be demolished, and for students like Gemma, they started today in different schools as state troopers were deployed throughout the district. All students were given the option of remote learning from home as well. Parents all across the country have been sending their students back off to school over these past weeks at a time when educators are coping with extreme challenges, the fear of going to class, teacher strikes like the one in Seattle looming, and shortages of teachers from coast to coast. Our Maria Villarreal was one of the first reporters on the scene in Uvalde that horrific day. She's there for us once again tonight as part of ABC's Uvalde 365, a year in the community. Tonight, the excitement of the first day of school, helping some of the Robb Elementary students and community move beyond the shadow of the mass shooting tragedy. Their former school shuttered for good. The three other elementary schools in the district taking them in. Comfort dogs and extra law enforcement on hand. Eight-foot fencing now under construction. On the first day back to school, the road to healing in Uvalde is now lined with posters and makeshift memorials reminding families how strong this city is. Business walls now serving as a canvas for 21 larger-than-life murals honoring the victims. That's so good. This is Tess Mata. A cat-loving Astros fan that wanted to be a TikTok star. When I met up with the Mathas recently, she has your ears. <laughs> they were smiling from ear to ear as they showed off their daughter's mural. Proud to admit they drive by here at least once a day to say hi. Before we go to work every morning, we drive this way and mm -hmm. we come through the back road and then, and we, then come we come down come this way and we'll say good morning. And, and it's we'll just like she's smiling at us with the peace sign, you know. Start our day and put the smile on our face. So you guys go out of your way just to come oh, by here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a stark contrast from when we first met the family back in May. Jerry telling us how he stood outside Rob and watched as kids escaped from the windows. If I could have ran inside and do something myself, I, I would have been so close right there across the street, knowing that she was in there. You know, what do you do? The couple sat down with us and their older daughter, Faith, less than two days after the shooting. For those people who watch this and say, that will never happen in my town. <laughs> How many times did we say that? Oh, Every time we turned on the news and we heard of another shooting that could never happen here. 
It happened here. It happened here and it took my baby. It took so many beautiful babies away from their families. Three weeks after the shooting, Tess was laid to rest. Her family traveled out of state in July to regroup, coming back in August with renewed focus and inspiration. We can't let that anger take over our lives. You know, Tess wasn't an angry person, and I don't, I don't think I can live being angry all the time. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I can't do that. And Tess is on the night. I can't. There's, there's ways that, you know, we can still get justice without being angry now. Please welcome, from Uvalde, Faith Justine. Tess's older sister threw out the first pitch at an Astros game in her sister's honor. And it's a strike. Jerry is now back at work. And sometimes I was thinking that I don't think I was going to go back this year, you know, just with the, the pain and hurt. You know, when my wife told me that she was going to try to go back too, I said, you know, well, if she goes back, then I, don't, I need to go back. You are making it accessible and easy for these people. And Veronica found guns. her voice standing up for all of the victims and pushing for change at the steps of the Texas State Capitol. Xavier Lopez, McKenna Lee Elrod, Layla Salazar. Three months after losing their daughter, the family is finding strength in Tessa's memory. Veronica is a teacher with the district and is planning to be back in the classroom this year. There are a lot of people around the country, right, that are watching what happens in Uvalde. I think people are rooting, right, for this community. But I imagine that the question on not just everybody's mind, but really the people who live here, right, the families, the parents, do you feel safe going back and working? I do. Um, there, it's, it's slow, it's, but I know that they're coming along. Did you really have to wrestle with yourself about going back? No. It was never a question? It was a question of whether I was mentally ready, but not to go back. Teaching was always something I've wanted to do, and I know that Tess would have wanted me to go back. So many grappling with just such difficult decisions. Maria Villarreal joins us now. Maria, uh, there's some news today regarding the latest into the investigation. What are you hearing? There is, Lindsay. Right now, ABC has confirmed that DPS is done with their internal review, and they have now referred the inactions or actions of five troopers to the inspector general. Now, he will conduct a formal investigation, and then based on that, he will decide whether disciplinary action should be taken against these troopers. He can also refer his findings to prosecutors, and these guys, these troopers, could face criminal charges in the future. Lindsay? Maria Villarreal, thanks so much. Now to the battle over the classified documents retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. Tonight, the Justice Department is weighing a response after a Florida judge granted former President Trump's request for a special master to review the documents seized by the FBI, a decision that's even being criticized by Trump's former attorney general. So let's bring in ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, how did the judge explain her decision to grant Trump's request for a special master, and how's that decision being received? Well, her basic position is that in the issue interest of fairness, you needed to do this on behalf of a former president. And she talked about the notion that there were other documents seized at Mar-a-Lago to include perhaps medical records, tax records, and other personal items that were included in those boxes that the FBI took uh, from the premises. Uh, her position, which is coming into some criticizing, criticism, is that she's talking about this notion that the, the president's reputation could be damaged. And these are just not the kinds of things that most uh, suspects are afforded in terms of deference, Lindley. And Pierre, where does the granting of this request for a special master put the larger Justice Department investigation at this point? Well, to be clear, the Justice Department was arguing against this particular move. They said that the president had no standing uh, to claim any kind of executive privilege, that these documents belong to the United States government. They do not belong to him. And right now, one of the key issues is that the judge in issuing this order to uh, a point of special master is not only calling on the Justice Department to come up with some names of potential people to play that role, she also has basically forbade DOJ from using the documents in reviewing the documents as a part of their criminal investigation until that matter is resolved. 
All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Pleasure. And for more on this, we're joined now by ABC News contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks so much once again for being here. Uh, let's start off just with your reaction to the judge's ruling to actually grant Trump's request for a special master. Did that surprise you? Um, it didn't surprise me to grant a special master to review the attorney-client privilege documents. It was mind-blowing, mind-boggling that she granted the request for a special master to determine whether items are subject to the executive privilege. There really is no uh, basis in the law and precedent it's for doing something like that for a former president. Some people are saying, well, of course, she was appointed by Trump. What do you expect? Of course, she's going to rule in his favor. Do you think there's anything there? I, I don't. I don't think so. And I, I think she's just, maybe she's just trying to be really careful. Maybe she's trying to uh, put some of the responsibility on an independent special master instead of following, you know, what I see as pretty clear precedent that you don't need a special master to decide executive privilege. How do you think this will impact the Justice Department's investigation going forward? And do you expect them to appeal? Uh, it's going to slow down their investigation to a crawl. Uh, the reason is, what will happen is, uh, Trump, the former president, is going to fight about everything, about who the special master is going to be, about the process, and about everything. And there are 11,000 documents involved. Uh, I can see DOJ filing an appeal just because of how bad of a precedent this opinion sets. We heard Pierre talk about that Friday deadline. What do you expect to happen at that point? Uh, either DOJ is going to appeal before then, or they're both going to each party, DOJ and Trump, are going to put in competing submissions. It's supposed to be a joint submission, but I think that submission is going to say, we're DOJ, we want this, we're Trump, we want this, and there's not going to be that much overlap. All right, so let's talk about the implications uh, of the upcoming election with regard to this investigation. Of course, there's that unwritten rule that the DOJ has where they don't react, basically, or don't act uh, for 60 days leading into an election so that it doesn't seem like there's anything uh, biased or improper going on. So how will that influence? Um, First of all, you are absolutely right. It's an unwritten rule. The DOJ tries to avoid overt actions uh, that could uh, influence an election. And I think that's important to remember. I think if there's a grand jury out there, it's going to continue its investigation. DOJ will continue its investigation uh, and do all the covert things like speaking with witnesses, things like that, that bringing people into the grand jury. What they likely won't do is do something overt, like charge somebody. Uh, some new developments out of New Mexico where you had a public official who was removed from office after participating in January 6th. I explain to us the, the circumstances um, uh, surrounding that and what that means now going forward. Well, what basically happened was there was a county commissioner in New Mexico who uh, had been convicted federally for his participation in the events of January 6th and uh, a private citizens group brought an action to disqualify him from holding office as a public commissioner, as a public official. Uh, and the basis for that is, under the 14th Amendment, there's a disqualification clause, which says that if you're a public official and then you commit insurrection, you can no longer hold public office. So this is pretty groundbreaking. This is the first time, I believe, since the 1800s, since this disqualification clause has been used. So it could potentially be groundbreaking. And before I let you go, I want to go back to Trump just really quickly. We're, of course, getting everybody's opinion here. Everybody has one with regard to, do you think that Trump will ultimately be indicted? I think there is so much evidence there that in any other case, somebody would have charged this. Con Nowaday, we thank you so much, as always. Next to the coast to coast extreme weather, flooding on the East Coast and record heat and fire danger in the West. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking both for us. We'll get to her in just a moment. But first, Will Carr is on the fire lines as the record heat there is fueling fast spreading wildfires. And now there's concern about blackouts as the state's grid is up to the highest demand ever. Hey, Will. Good evening, Lindsay. This was a fast moving fire that swept through this community and you can see where the fire crews made their stand here, dropping this pink fire retardant, that FOSS check on this side of the road. We got a fire truck coming through here. They have been racing up and down this street throughout the course of the day, doing everything they can to protect this community. Like I said, this fire broke out so quickly. It burned about 500 acres within the first hour and you can see what happened across the street here. We've seen a number of homes, a number 
number of structures that have burned to the ground. In the distance, you can see that plume of smoke billowing up. This has been uh, sparked by the historic drought. These fuels are bone dry and also the heat wave that we've been experiencing here on the West Coast. It's more than 100 degrees here in Hemet right now. And across the West Coast, we're going to see these scorching temperatures throughout the rest of the week. Lindsay. Thanks, Will. Now let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who's tracking the fire danger, that record heat, and the flood concern on the East Coast. Hey, Ginger. Hey, as much as we love seeing some of this rain, Lindsay, we desperately needed it because of the drought. We just probably did not need 8 to 10 inches to fall in less than 24 hours. And unfortunately, those were some of the numbers from Connecticut to Rhode Island today. There are lingering showers that will go through tonight. Even northeastern Pennsylvania could pick up some heavier pockets going through early tomorrow morning. But for the most part, this is dying down. What is not dying down is the heat out west. We've already, throughout Labor Day, seen all-time September heat records broken from Sacramento. They could tie or break it again today. Salt Lake City today and Grand Junction, Colorado, among the cities that broke their all-time September heat. So this is not something that's ending. We're going to see it kind of waver. Sacramento, for example, staying at or above about 110 through most of the week. Salt Lake City finally dropping as we get into the next weekend. There is so much heat out there, and unfortunately what this does is just a bad cycle. It dries out the soil and all the foliage, and it becomes even drier. So they desperately, desperately need a shift in pattern, which this isn't the season for that, Lindsay. Uh, they could use the rain that we have here on the northeast over there on the west coast for sure. Ginger, our thanks to you as always. And when we come back, he pleaded guilty to providing sex parties, hotels, and other gifts in a Navy corruption scandal. Now he's on the run. It started in middle school, and now they're a world-famous band. We go on stage with OAR, talking to them about the highs and lows of their long career and how what they sing about has evolved over the years. But up next, as Ukraine launches a major counteroffensive, David Muir travels to the country talking to President Zelensky about his country's fight and visiting in an area where Russian forces are accused of killing countless civilians. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> like you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on the tough questions with straightforward reporting. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. In Ukraine tonight, ABC News is getting never-before-seen video from Bucha, where Russia is accused of perpetrating war crimes. A Russian soldier shooting out a camera so there would be no evidence. World News Tonight anchor David Muir traveled to Bucha to witness the aftermath of the atrocities there, those that remain still grieving after the unspeakable horrors that took place. 20 miles outside the capital of Kyiv, the sun low in the sky over Bucha. The scars are still deep and visible here. The sacred plot of land behind a church, a mass grave for more than 100 bodies, Ukrainians left dead in the streets. Authorities say civilians brutally murdered by the Russians. The surveillance of Russian tanks rolling into Bucha shortly after the invasion. And tonight, ABC News obtaining these images. Authorities say a Russian soldier repeatedly firing at a security camera until he hits it. The Russians destroying the cameras, investigators say, to hide their soldiers from view. Here on the ground, six months later, we meet a young man whose father was murdered, determined to piece together the evidence. 20-year-old Vadim Evdokimenko takes us to this garage. And this is where you believe your father died? Inside, the blackened walls, the smell of fire, of ash, as we see the charred opening to the basement below, where his father, Oleksiy, a mechanic, was hiding with several others. Authorities believe that they were hiding here in the basement from the Russians who'd pulled up in their tanks. He says Russians were stationed outside and that neighbors hiding in their basements could hear the fire and the screams. And tonight, this video authorities have now studied from that neighborhood, a Russian armored vehicle outside that garage, soldiers standing nearby. People were terrified. Yeah. It still smells like fire in here. He tells me all around we see the evidence. Vadim shows us what authorities handed over to him. Images of his father's burned jeans inside, his bank cards, his work ID. They told Vadim five adults were killed here, including his father. And then a sad reality when Vadim points to more human bones right there in the ash. And while we're there... How are you? Investigators arrive from the Bucha police, unit number one. They tell us a neighbor called saying additional bones had been found. Officer opens her case, placing evidence markers in front of each discovery. And we ask her, months after the Russians retreated, how often are they still answering these calls? Have you been to scenes like this before? Well, sometimes it's once a week. Once a week. Still, six months later. All of this evidence, part of a mounting war crimes investigation here in Bucha. And where city cameras were destroyed and evidence burned, they have turned to witnesses. This video of a doctor who, even while the Russians were still here, bravely went out into the streets, placing bodies in bags and bringing them to the mass grave at that church. He believed it was his duty. We went to find him. Dr. Dovkapal. David. Hello. Nice to meet you. Dr. Anton Dovkapal, still working at the local hospital. He tells me he remembers the Russians and their threats as he carried those bodies away. The Russians told you that if you went in certain areas, they would kill you. Yes, he says. They said, don't go there. You might never come back. He shows me the images on his phone. 
images he now hopes will help prosecutors. Why did you do it? Why did you help these people? He tells me everyone must do what he can do. And you remember every one of those bodies. We meet Andrei Nebitov, the chief of the Kyiv region police, investigating war crimes. 116 bodies were exhumed from right here. We walk to that mass grave where bodies have now been exhumed and given a proper burial. He reveals what some of the Russians left behind here in Bucha. Paperwork, lists of names, Russian soldiers and their units, where they were stationed in Bucha. Some of these units left behind lists of soldiers who were in the unit. When they were retreating, they were in such a hurry, he says, that sometimes they left very precious papers, like the lists of soldiers, which we now have. We can identify exactly who was at which location. In some cases, the names of their wives, their children, and their full addresses. President Zelensky visiting Bucha the day after the Russians left. The world saw his grief, his anger. Months later, we now ask him about the case they're building. What does justice look like? For me and for the world, it is important that fair and just and independent tribunal uh, is organized so all those responsible are charged, convicted, if proven, and pay the price, and pay the price with long-term long prison sentences. And for Vadim, who brought us to that garage, there will be no peace until there is justice. You want justice for your father? No, no. What would you say to your father if you could? He says, I would tell him that I love him very much. World News Tonight anchor David Muir joins us now from Lviv. Just incredible reporting on the ground all throughout Ukraine, David. Uh, those bones, the, the burned genes, presumably of the Deem's father, it, just heartbreaking all around. And, and we just heard, of course, from the Deem saying he wished that he could tell his dad that he loved him, one of so many who feel that way. What's going to stick with you when you come back? What can't you unsee? What, what can't you unhear uh, from Bucha in particular? Well, it's just extraordinary when you drive into that community. You know, those images at the very beginning of the report show that it was uh, such a beautiful place. And as the sun was uh, setting, uh, when we captured those images, you can still see the beauty. Uh, the, the sad irony is that you get closer to the city and you realize the scars are still so, so deep and so raw. You know, Vadim, uh, he's just 20 years old uh, and he's now part of this investigation. He's working to sort of connect the dots on his own uh, for justice uh, for his father and to walk to that garage which he certainly knew was the place where they believe his father uh, was uh, burned to death along with uh, four other adults. But while we were there, you know, on that particular day, the discovery that there were actually uh, even more bones in there in the ash. And uh, it sounds ghoulish and it honestly, it, it is. It's extraordinarily difficult, which is why I asked the, the officer on the scene, uh, are you still getting these calls? And she looked at us and said, at least at least once a week, they're still getting these calls, uh, nearly six months after the Russians retreated from Bucha. And Lindsay, one other thing that I will never forget is this doctor. Uh, think about what he did. The Russians were still in Bucha, and it was his belief, his, his belief that uh, he should be out there on the streets retrieving those bodies, respecting them in some way, making sure they weren't just left there. He knew that these were uh, people. They, they had stories behind them, loved ones who didn't know uh, where they had gone. Uh, and he went out on those streets, even with the Russians still there, put them in body bags and brought them by truck over to that mass uh, site behind the church. What an extraordinary thing he did. Even with threats from the Russians, he still continued to do it. And just in recent days, they exhumed uh, many of those bodies, giving them a proper burial. And in talking with the doctor back at work at that hospital, you could see it in his eyes. Um, he's still so broken. He remembers every single one of those people. 
that he retrieved from the streets. Uh, he will never forget them. And I asked him, you know, why did you do it? And you heard what he said there. He said, every man must do what they can. And that's really the true spirit of Ukraine. The fathers who are fighting in this war, the mothers, many of whom took their children to foreign communities where they're starting school, even other countries, as you know, Lindsay, we've been reporting on this for months, but it is this spirit, this enduring spirit reflected in their leader, President Zelensky. And of course, we saw that in that exclusive interview 24 hours ago as well. Just remarkable what the people are continuing to endure on a daily basis. David Muir, we thank you so much for your reporting. Always good to be with you, Lindsay. Once again today, President Zelensky called for the U.S. and President Biden to recognize Russia as a state sponsor of terror. President Biden responded to that question last night when asked by ABC News. Take a listen. Mr. President, should Russia be designated a state sponsor of terrorism? Let's bring in ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce. Mary, how is the White House explaining the president's no? Well, the White House says they've already imposed harsh costs on Russia through sanctions, crippling the Russian economy, cutting them off from the rest of the world. But the White House is firm on this. This is the president's final answer. Russia will not be designated a state sponsor of terror, which would effectively sever any remaining diplomatic ties between the U.S. and Moscow. Now, when pressed on this today, the White House warned that taking this step could have unintended consequences, saying it could hurt any efforts, jeopardize any attempts to get further humanitarian aid into Ukraine. Ukraine and also warning that it could possibly make it more difficult to ultimately try and negotiate a peace deal. Lindsay. Mary Bruce reporting from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. We turn now to news that Russia is buying millions of artillery shells and rockets from North Korea. Let's bring in ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz, who's in Washington for more. Martha, what do we know about these purchases and what does that reveal about Russia's position in the war right now? Lindsay, because of those sanctions and the fact that Ukrainians really are pounding Russian ammunition depots, the Russians are facing a severe supply shortage, which is why they're forced to seek millions of rockets and artillery shells from North Korea. Just think about it. The Russians need ammunition so badly they're willing to buy back Soviet-era equipment from the North Koreans that they sold to them decades ago, Lindsay. Mm, really is profound there. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you as always. Still ahead here on Prime, the years-long search by one mother for the suspect accused of killing her daughter. We've talked a lot, certainly recently, about the dramatic swings with Bed Bath & Beyond stocks fueled by speculation online. Tonight, their stocks faced even more volatility, but this time after its chief financial officer committed suicide. And Britain has its third female prime minister in its history. Friendly reminder, the U.S. has never had a female lead this nation. We take a look at all of this by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Jason Momoa, look at him, cut off his hair. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring your friends. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. 
a place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. The United Kingdom has a new prime minister. We're taking a look by the numbers. 47-year-old Liz Truss became prime minister of the UK today, selected by her conservative party to finish out Boris Johnson's term without a public election. It comes two months after Johnson first announced his intention to resign following a series of scandals that ended his three years leading Britain's conservative party. Truss is the fourth prime minister since 2016, as political turmoil has hit Britain since the launch of the Brexit campaign and the shocks of the global pandemic. Truss most recently served as Britain's foreign secretary. Truss is the 15th prime minister to serve under Queen Elizabeth II, who received her at Balmoral Castle in Scotland today, where she formally asked Truss to form a new government. This is the first time in her 70 years of rule that the 96-year-old queen has not recognized a new prime minister from Buckingham Palace. Notably, Truss now becomes the third female prime minister in British history, following the footsteps of Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher. There have been zero female heads of state for the former British colonies, now known, of course, as the United States of America in the 246 years since declaring independence. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Why an e-cigarette company was just ordered to pay more than $400 million in a settlement. A major upset at the U.S. Open, the incredible journey that led Francis Tiafo to this moment. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Thank you. 
Extreme weather stretching out across all corners of the country. In the west, the region melting under a record-breaking heat wave. Multiple wildfires breaking out in California. The Fairview fire exploding in the city of Hammond, scorching more than 2,700 acres, killing two people and injuring three others. At least 1,500 households told to get to safety as the fire rages over the hillsides. Just north of the Fairview fire, the Radford Brush Fire burning hundreds of acres in the San Bernardino Forest and also prompting evacuations. And in Northern California, crews are making progress, fighting a pair of fires that have also claimed the lives of two people. The fire threat exploding during a historic heat wave, temperatures nearly 20 degrees above normal. A suspect at the center of the biggest bribery scandal in U.S. Navy history has escaped from house arrest. Leonard Glenn Francis, known as Fat Leonard, cut off his GPS monitoring ankle bracelet and got away. He pleaded guilty and had been on house arrest since 2018 in San Diego, awaiting sentencing. Prosecutors say Francis provided meals, hotel accommodations, prostitutes, and other gifts to Navy members in exchange for information regarding ship movements. U.S. Marshals say he may have already escaped to Mexico. Police are investigating the death of Bed Bath & Beyond CFO Gustavo Arnal, the executive dying by suicide, plunging from this luxury high-rise in downtown Manhattan Friday. Arnal's death coming days after the struggling retail giant announced it would close around 150 stores and lay off a fifth of its employees. This on top of the $1.2 billion stock fraud lawsuit facing Bed Bath & Beyond. Arnal named as a defendant in that class action lawsuit along with investor Ryan Cohen and others. The defendants accused of artificially inflating the company's value when Cohen bought nearly a 10% stake in the company and then sold it for a huge profit a few months later. Canadian authorities still searching for one of two suspects involved in a stabbing rampage that killed at least 11 and wounded 19 people across Canada's Saskatchewan province. Police searching for Miles Sanderson. They say he is armed and dangerous. Authorities today investigated a possible sighting of Sanderson on James Smith Cree Nation, but did not locate him there. His brother, Damien Sanderson, was found dead Monday. Police still investigating a motive, saying they believe some of the stabbings were targeted and others random. E-cigarette maker Juul agreed to pay nearly half a billion dollars in a settlement reached with 34 states on how it marketed its vape products, especially to minors. An investigation by three dozen states said launch parties, trendy looking models and social media posts relentlessly marketed to underage users while Juul manipulated the chemical composition of its products to make them less harsh. Connecticut Attorney General William Tong said Juul agreed to pay $438 million to resolve the investigation. We think that this will go a long way in stemming the flow of youth vaping. This isn't how you want to start the day. The exodus of people trying to leave Burning Man left people stuck in line for more than nine hours, according to organizers. Attendees who hadn't left yet were asked to stay on site to prevent delays from increasing, and people in long lines this morning were urged to turn off their engines in order to conserve gas. It was the first time the festival had been held since the start of the pandemic. Police have now identified a body found in Memphis as a teacher who was abducted last week. Authorities had been searching for Eliza Fletcher since Friday when police say she was kidnapped while jogging around 4 a.m. Investigators say surveillance video showed a man hopping from a black GMC SUV and forcing the mother of two into the vehicle. The suspect, Cleotha Abstin, is now facing several charges, including first-degree murder. Now to the mother and former detective who refused to give up on finding the man suspected of killing her daughter. A former Marine is now in custody. He was caught after six years on the run. TJ Holmes has more on what was done to track down the main suspect. Let's send up these balloons for Crystal for victory right now. Yeah. Yeah. A celebration six years in the making at the grave site of Crystal Mitchell. Six years since the 30-year-old mother of two was brutally murdered. Finally, a suspect has been arrested. I used to come here every day and cry about how I did not have justice for her, how I couldn't protect her, how I couldn't protect her children from this tragedy. And today I'm celebrating the place where I was broken and, and devastated to say, we got him, Crystal. And other women out there would not be hurt by him. We've got him. 
The years-long manhunt for the suspect is over after Mitchell's boyfriend, 37-year-old Raymond McLeod, a former Marine and bodybuilder on the run since 2016 and one of the U.S. Marshals' 15 most wanted fugitives, was arrested. McLeod has pleaded not guilty to the murder charge in court where a judge ordered cameras not show his face. He was caught after investigators received a tip that McLeod was teaching English at a school in El Salvador under an assumed name. Yes, I got him. Marshals credit Mitchell's mother, Josephine Wenzel, with helping investigators and pursuing various leads over the years, calling the retired police detective a driving force in the arrest. It's not about being a former detective. It's about being a mom. It's that mama bear. It's that mom determination that I gave birth to this child. And so help me God, I'm going to take care of this child until I die. According to investigators, McLeod was the last person seen with Mitchell before she died. The Arizona couple was visiting San Diego and staying with friends in June of 2016. They were reportedly heard arguing during the night. The next day, one of the friends found Mitchell strangled to death in a bedroom. McLeod nowhere to be found. U.S. Marshals believe he fled through Mexico to Central America and over the years was reportedly seen in Guatemala and Belize. Last year, they announced a $50,000 reward for information that would lead to his capture. He really laid low and didn't pop his head up a whole lot. Obviously, have some training on clandestine operations and things like that that I'm sure he referred to. It was years of hard work. And to be honest with you, I wasn't sure. I mean, we're talking about you know, Central America and Mexico, the most important thing is to get their faces out in public. But Wenzel says her work isn't done. So let's just say victory yeah. for this country. Yeah. She now wants to remember her daughter's beauty, humor, and big heart, things she now sees in her two grandchildren who she has been raising since their mother's death. But Wenzel also is not finished seeking justice for her daughter. This is one chapter closed. Now I have another chapter that I have to uh, be involved in, and that's the justice system. I told the prosecutors that I hope they do their due diligence. I'm there to help make sure the case goes through and that I do not want his feet to touch the streets again and do whatever you can to keep make that happen because my family deserves that justice like that. That mama bear instinct, our thanks to T.J. Holmes for that. Meghan Markle took center stage in her first public speech in the U.K. since stepping back from royal duties with Prince Harry just days after her tell-all interview. It was a stop on the couple's mini tour with visits along the way in U.K. as well as Germany. ABC's Maggie Rooley has the details. It is very nice to be back in the U.K. Megan taking center stage at a youth empowerment summit in Manchester. Please welcome Megan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. The Duke and Duchess receiving a standing ovation before Megan gave the keynote speech to young leaders from around the world. You are the future. But I would like to add to that, that you are also the present. You are the ones driving the positive and necessary change needed across the globe now in this very moment. And for that, I'm so grateful to be in your company today. This speech, the first time the Duchess has spoken publicly in England since she and Harry left royal life. While in the UK, the couple are staying at Frogmore Cottage on the Queen's Windsor Castle estate, just a short walk from Prince William's new home, Adelaide Cottage. But there are no plans for the brothers or their wives to meet. Until the book that Harry has penned has actually been published, I think there's a lack of trust between the two brothers. To be fair to Prince William, he doesn't know what's going to be used and put out there in public. He has a responsibility as a future king to make sure that the monarchy is not brought into disrepute. And at the moment, that's exactly what Harry and Meghan are doing. The couple's visit coming just days after Meghan's tell-all interview with The Cut magazine, saying of her time as a royal that just by existing, we were upsetting the dynamic of the hierarchy and that she was still healing from the experience. A lot of people do support Meghan and Harry. The younger generation, I think, feel they've been treated unfairly. But yeah, I do believe that when you continually snipe at your own family, you are going to lose popularity. People are going to understand what's the point of it and why are they attacking the royal family when, frankly, uh, the best thing to do is to try to <laughs> extend an olive branch and build bridges, and that's simply not happening.
happening at all. Our thanks to Maggie for that. Their names live on in jam band infamy. OAR has been on the scene for decades, known for their catchy tunes and long-lasting concerts. And the band has achieved longevity not by reinvention, but by knowing what they do well and forming a meaningful connection with their fans. In tonight's Prime playlist, our Phil Lipoff sits down with the band to talk about how they met, their most memorable moments, and navigating life on the road with growing families at home. What happens when two friends come together to make music? One heavily influenced by reggae and Bob Marley. Stand up for your rights. The other by hard rock and Metallica. You get a sound, a band, and a friendship that stands the test of time. In a way, I need a change from this burnout scene. Another time, another town, another everything. From number one hits like Shattered, to epic live performances. OAR has earned its place in jam band history. We believe in community. We believe in message. We believe in the pulse. We're in this thing together. On this night, in Salt Lake City, doing what they've done for more than 20 years, having a conversation with the crowd. I don't know about you guys, but I feel pretty good. The band calls it an exchange of energy that pushes them to stretch three-minute songs into 20-minute versions, collectively improvising. The result, something new night after night. Joining the original five members on stage for years now, Mike Paris on the keys and John Lampley on the trumpet. What's special about this after 25 years is that you can write a set list, but you really don't know what you're gonna get until you get on stage that night. We all have to be flexible, including our team on stage, our techs, our lighting guy. We're all kind of in that flowy state, or able to be in that flowy state whenever we need to. When your lead singer and drummer have been playing together since eighth grade, there is a special connection. Here are frontman Mark Roberge and drummer Chris Kulos at their middle school talent show. They recruited Richard Ahn and Benj Gershman in 1996 while attending their Rockville, Maryland high school. When we started out, we were doing uh, local bar shows for our friends where the teachers would be there from the high school. Our job was to keep them entertained for two and a half hours so our friends could have a good time. Later, meeting saxophonist Jerry DePizzo at Ohio State as they became a staple on the college rock scene in the late 90s. <laughs> Grassroots growth that created an intensely loyal fan base from their first album, The Wanderer, released in 1997, with songs like That Was a Crazy Game of Poker. They ended up playing with the devil at a saloon. <laughs> to constant touring, because the live experience really defines this band. So good, so much fun, more and more people had to see them. And in 2006, OAR played the show of all shows to a sold out crowd at Madison Square Garden, the pinnacle of any band's career. So rise on up to that highest mountain top. After the show, we decided every night is MSG. This is an attitude we've taken from that moment that no matter where we play, we're bringing the same show, the same energy, the same honest gratitude to this day, we don't know what version we're gonna play that night. And how does it, how does it take shape? I'm stepping up to that microphone with zero plan. Who says you can go where you wanna, California? Fans also getting some life advice in what has become an anthem for being who you are. California. In their single, California, Mark sings, if you never want to be a silhouette, you've got to find your light. You've got to find your light. I want to be a musician. I want to be an engineer, whatever. We need to support that in every 
single aspect. So California represents for me not only being a parent, but it represents what love truly is. It's between people. That sentiment so important to each member of the band, not just as rock stars with a platform, but now as fathers too. Why don't you FaceTime your kid? Some of Mark's most profound lyrics come from personal experiences like this one, captured in the music video for I Go Through. You go over and under, I go through. Heading out on tour when his phone rings, his kids missing him already, and then this from his son. A gut punch any parent understands. That moment, now a verse in the song. My kitty asked me, Daddy, when you coming home to me from work? If I'm being honest, man, that hurt. The chorus, then a vivid description of what seems impossible at times. It's really tough to answer those questions. When and you're coming home from work? Yeah, like why do, you, why do you have to go play shows? Can I come, why can't I come? My oldest is 10, I haven't seen him cry like that in a long time. So yeah, it's, it's hard, it's hard for them. But we're doing our best. My son hasn't experienced me leaving. And so to be honest with you, it's a struggle to figure out how to, you know, help him be okay with it because he doesn't understand dad's gone. It's a tough balance, but one they all agree is worth it. Their success allowing them to create the Herd the World Fund. A portion of concert tickets go into this fund and we try to find great opportunity for it. We work with Ohio State University to provide scholarship opportunities. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, it's a gritty area. There could be a heck of a lot more opportunity in Youngstown and this is one way that we're able to provide that. The give and take from the audience is everything to OAR. It's so powerful, they wanted to show us. And we want to bring out a friend of ours to join us for, this, for the song tonight. Come on out, give a warm welcome to Mr. Phil Lipoff. Come on out, girl. Inviting me up to play with them. Their hit song, Hey Girl. At one point, Mark coming over and pointing to the crowd, highlighting what he means by that exchange of energy. Their new album, The Arcade, is out now, and their touring continues. More than two decades after that first album, with new fans at shows and some longtime faithful as well, this is what it all comes down to for OAR. We're the lucky ones, man. Honestly, we, we just are psyched to get the opportunity to talk about this thing that we care about so much. Yeah. We're not pumping our tires, we just, we, we get it. We're, we're, we're lucky to be doing yeah. this and we get it. Phil's tires were totally pumped after that moment on stage. We love to see it, and thanks, Phil, for bringing us that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. This vulture on the verge of extinction has been rehabilitated thanks to a group in Turkey working to protect and treat these majestic animals. And that's our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Over the next hour, word of a deadly shark attack in a popular snorkeling area in the Bahamas. And the new warning to parents about Roblox and some content that they may not know can be found on there. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download 
Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A 58-year-old Pennsylvania woman was killed during a bull shark attack off Rose Island in the Bahamas. Police say the woman was snorkeling with family when she was attacked by a bull shark. This particular island off Nassau was also the scene of another deadly shark attack back in 2019. The manhunt for a criminal known as Fat Leonard is underway. After cutting off his GPS monitoring ankle bracelet, Leonard Glenn Francis pleaded guilty to orchestrating the Fat Leonard corruption scandal which offered half a million dollars in bribes to Navy officers in exchange the officers passed him classified information and even went so far as redirecting military vessels to ports that were lucrative for his Singapore based ship servicing company a stunning upset at the US Open Rafael Nadal the number two seed and 22 time major champion defeated by their Oh, there's not, there's uh, Rafael Nadal saying goodbye there, but we're looking to see Francis Tiafo. For Rafa, there he is. For Rafa, it's the end of his 22 match Grand Slam winning streak and means the top two seeds of the men's tournament have both fallen before the quarterfinal round. Tiafo had an incredible journey to this moment, the son of parents who immigrated from Sierra Leone. He lived on the grounds of a Maryland tennis center where his father worked. Now to the battle over the classified documents retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. Tonight, the Justice Department is weighing a response after a Florida judge granted former President Trump's request for a special master to review the documents seized by the FBI, a decision that's even being criticized by Trump's former attorney general. So let's bring in ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, how did the judge explain her decision to grant Trump's request for a special master, and how's that decision being received? Well, her basic position is that in the issue interest of fairness, you needed to do this on behalf of a former president. And she talked about the notion that there were other documents seized at Mar-a-Lago to include perhaps medical records, tax records, and other personal items that were included in those boxes that the FBI took uh, from the premises. Uh, her position, which is coming into some criticizing, criticism, is that she's talking about this notion that the, the president's reputation could be damaged. And these are just not the kinds of things that most uh, suspects are afforded in terms of deference, Lindley. And Pierre, where does the granting of this request for a special master put the larger Justice Department investigation at this point? Well, to be clear, the Justice Department was arguing against this particular move. They said that the president had no standing uh, to claim any kind of executive privilege, that these documents belong to the United States government. They do not belong to him. And right now, one of the key issues is that the judge in issuing this order to uh, appoint a special master is not only calling on the Justice Department to come up with some names of potential people to play that role, she also has basically forbade DOJ from using the documents in reviewing the documents as a part of their criminal investigation until that matter is resolved. All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Pleasure. And for more on this, we're joined now by ABC News contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks so much once again for being here. Uh, let's start off just with your reaction to the judge's ruling to actually grant Trump's request for a special master. Did that surprise you? Um, it didn't surprise me 
to grant a special master to review the attorney-client privilege documents. It was mind-blowing, mind-boggling that she granted the request for a special master to determine whether items are subject to the executive privilege. There really is no uh, basis in the law and precedent It's for doing something like that for a former president. Some people are saying, well, of course she was appointed by Trump. What do you expect? Of course she's going to rule in his favor. Do you think there's anything there? I, I don't. I don't think so. And I, I think she's just, maybe she's just trying to be really careful. Maybe she's trying to uh, put some of the responsibility on an independent special master instead of following, you know, what I see as pretty clear precedent that you don't need a special master to decide executive privilege. How do you think this will impact the Justice Department's investigation going forward? And do you expect them to appeal? Uh, it's going to slow down their investigation to a crawl. Uh, the reason is, what will happen is, uh, Trump, the former president, is going to fight about everything, about who the special master is going to be, about the process, and about everything. And there are 11,000 documents involved. Uh, I can see DOJ filing an appeal just because of how bad of a precedent this opinion sets. We heard Pierre talk about that Friday deadline. What do you expect to happen at that point? Uh, either DOJ is going to appeal before then, or they're both going to each party, DOJ and Trump, are going to put in competing submissions. It's supposed to be a joint submission, but I think that submission is going to say, we're DOJ, we want this, we're Trump, we want this, and there's not going to be that much overlap. All right, so let's talk about the implications uh, of the upcoming election with regard to this investigation. Of course, there's that unwritten rule that the DOJ has where they don't react, basically, or don't act uh, for 60 days leading into an election, so that it doesn't seem like there's anything uh, biased or improper going on. So how will that influence? Um, First of all, you are absolutely right. It's an unwritten rule. The DOJ tries to avoid overt actions uh, that could uh, influence an election. And I think that's important to remember. I think if there's a grand jury out there, it's going to continue its investigation. DOJ will continue its investigation uh, and do all the covert things, like speaking with witnesses, things like that, that bringing people into the grand jury. What they likely won't do is do something overt, like charge somebody. Uh, some new developments out of New Mexico, where you had a public official who was removed from office after participating in January 6th. I explain to us the, the circumstances um, uh, surrounding that and what that means now going forward. Well, what basically happened was there was a county commissioner in New Mexico who uh, had been convicted federally for his participation in the events of January 6th, and uh, a private citizens group brought an action to disqualify him from holding office as a public commissioner, as a public official. Uh, and the basis for that is, under the 14th Amendment, there's a disqualification clause, which says that if you're a public official and then you commit insurrection, you can no longer hold public office. So this is pretty groundbreaking. This is the first time, I believe, since the 1800s, since this disqualification clause has been used. So it could potentially be groundbreaking. And before I let you go, I want to go back to Trump just really quickly. We're, of course, getting everybody's opinion here. Everybody has one with regard to, do you think that Trump will ultimately be indicted? I think there is so much evidence there that in any other case, somebody would have charged this. Con Nowaday, we thank you so much, as always. It is meant to be a day that parents look forward to and children anxiously await, but for the community in Uvalde this year, the first day of school is full of emotions. A new school year, new school, and a new reality for all. Here's our Maria Villarreal, who's in Uvalde for us tonight. Tonight, the excitement of the first day of school, helping some of the Robb Elementary students and community move beyond the shadow of the mass shooting tragedy. Their former school shuttered for good. The three other elementary schools in the district taking them in. Comfort dogs and extra law enforcement on hand. Eight-foot fencing now under construction. On the first day back to school, the road to healing in Uvalde is now lined with posters and makeshift memorials reminding families how strong this city is. Business walls now serving as a canvas for 21 larger-than-life murals honoring the victims. That's so good. This is Tess Mata, a cat-loving Astros fan that wanted to be a TikTok star. When I met up with the Mathas recently, she has your ears. <laughs> 
They were smiling from ear to ear as they showed off their daughter's mural. Proud to admit they drive by here at least once a day to say hi. Before we go to work every morning, we drive this way and mm -hmm. we come through the back road and then and we then come we down come this way and we'll say good morning. And, and it's we'll just like she's smiling at us with the peace day. sign, you know, start our day and puts a smile on her face. So and you guys go out of your way just to come oh, by here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a stark contrast from when we first met the family back in May. Jerry telling us how he stood outside Rob and watched as kids escaped from the windows. If I could have ran inside and do something myself, I, I would have, but so close right there, just across the street, knowing that she was in there. You know, what do you do? The couple sat down with us and their older daughter, Faith, less than two days after the shooting. For those people who watch this and say, that will never happen in my town. <laughs> How many times did we say that? Oh, Every time we turned on the news and we heard of another shooting that could never happen here. It happened here. <laughs> it happened here. Three weeks after the shooting, Tess was laid to rest. Her family traveled out of state in July to regroup, coming back in August with renewed focus and inspiration. We can't let that anger take over our lives. You know, Tess wasn't an angry person, and I don't, I don't think I can live being angry all the time. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I can't do that. And Tess is on the night. I can't. There's, there's ways that, you know, we can still get justice without being angry now. Please welcome, from Uvalde, Faith Justine. Tess's older sister threw out the first pitch at an Astros game in her sister's honor. And it's a strike. Jerry is now back at work. Sometimes I was thinking that I don't think I was going to go back this year, you know, just with the, the pain and hurt, you know, when... My wife told me that she was going to try to go back, too. I said, you know, well, if she goes back, then I, don't, I need to go back. You are making it accessible and easy for these people. And Veronica found guns. her voice standing up for all of the victims and pushing for change at the steps of the Texas State Capitol. Xavier Lopez, McKenna Lee Elrod, Layla Salazar, Three months after losing their daughter, the family is finding strength in Tessa's memory. Veronica is a teacher with the district and is planning to be back in the classroom this year. There are a lot of people around the country, right, that are watching what happens in Uvalde. I think people are rooting, right, for this community. But I imagine that the question on not just everybody's mind, but really the people who live here, right, the families, the parents, do you feel safe going back and working? I do. Um, there, it's it's slow. It's but I know that they're coming along. Did you really have to wrestle with yourself about going back? No. It was never a question. There was a question of whether I was mentally ready, but not to go back. Teaching was always something I've wanted to do, and I know that Tess would have wanted me to go back. Our thanks to Maria for that. Next to the coast to coast, record heat and fire danger in the West. Will Carr is on the fire lines as the record heat there is fueling fast, spreading wildfires. And now there's concern about blackouts as the state's grid is up to the highest demand ever. Good evening, Lindsay. This was a fast-moving fire that swept through this community, and you can see where the fire crews made their stand here, dropping this pink fire retardant, that FOSS check, on this side of the road. we got a fire truck coming through here. They have been racing up and down this street throughout the course of the day, doing everything they can to protect this community. Like I said, this fire broke out so quickly. It burned about 500 acres within the first hour, and you can see what happened. Across the street here, we've seen a number of homes, a number of structures that have burned to the ground. In the distance, you can see that plume of smoke billowing up. This has been uh, sparked by the historic drought. These fuels are bone dry and also the heat wave that we've been experiencing here on the West Coast. It's more than 100 degrees here in Hemet right now. And across the West Coast, we're going to see these scorching temperatures throughout the rest of the week.
Lindsay. Will, thank you. Now to our Cracking the Kid Code series. Roblox is, of course, a wildly popular online gaming platform for kids. And while its content may seem cartoonish and innocent, there is a warning tonight for parents about some content that is definitely not for kids. ABC's Becky Worldly reports. The children's gaming platform Roblox has more than 54 million daily users, almost half of whom are under 13. But it has some dark corners. Racist language and, and content and imagery, anti-Semitic commentary, sexist commentary, animated porn uh, simulated sex acts. And for Bennett, who's now nine years old, he stumbled upon just that kind of content back when he was seven. I found this like random game. I just heard a bad song and a bad picture. Bennett's dad, Brian, says he came across this real life photo, so graphic we had to blur it, of a woman's rear end in a thong. And the seven-year-old found it even though age restrictions were in place. I enabled the account restrictions, which according to Roblox, meant that my son would not be able to play any games that weren't specifically curated and, and deemed appropriate uh, by Roblox. But... I'll never forget how he, he kind of leaned over and handed me the iPad and he goes, Dad, something's, you know, something doesn't look right. With the account restriction still active, Brian says he saw even more. There was a depiction of, of a sexual act in, in the clouds that was very obviously uh, something quite graphic. Roblox says this content is not allowed, and the image that Bennett found was a result of a player exploiting a flaw in the system that has since been changed, telling ABC News that this happened two years ago. And we have strong systems and protocols in place to ensure these types of experiences are swiftly removed within minutes whenever bad actors attempt to circumvent our rules, and that the possibility children would ever come across this content remains extremely low. But Common Sense Media's Jeff Haynes says it's still happening and shows me in real time. That was a, a naked avatar right. on a bed. Um, I was not expecting to actually wander in. I just saw anti-Semitic speech. Yes. I saw hate speech mm -hmm. against people of color. I saw kids talking about school mm -hmm. and tons of discussion of sexual acts. Yes. That was just in the last 30 seconds of the chat, not to yeah. mention what we've seen in the room. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, the thing is, is that's just one experience. There are millions upon millions of experiences uploaded to Roblox every single day. These types of experiences aren't listed or promoted by Roblox. A user creates them and then shares links using third-party sites like Discord or TikTok, or even posting them in their user profile. The other things we saw are too graphic to show or describe. And while Roblox moderators are constantly removing rooms like this, Haynes says the sheer size of the platform means they can't keep up with the content. He says it's a game of whack-a-mole. A lot of it does wind up getting pulled down when it's found, but it can easily be re-uploaded within a matter of seconds. Leaving parents and kids wondering how to enjoy this wildly popular platform. Some helpful tips for parents there. Thanks to Becky for that. Still to come, what's being blamed for the deaths of hundreds of children and leading to warnings of a future famine? It's hard for some of us to stay off social media for more than a few minutes at a time, and an author says that's by design. Reporter Max Fisher tells us about his new book and why he believes social media has rewired our brains. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. We are tracking several headlines around the world. Thousands of flood victims affected by the overflowing Indus River in the Pakistan province took refuge in makeshift huts and a dry patch of land. Drone footage shows agriculture and residential areas completely submerged in water with just the tops of trees and buildings visible. The flooding has impacted 33 million people and killed more than 1,300. Hundreds of children have already died across Somalia one day after the UNICEF warned that parts of the country will be hit by famine in the coming months. The Horn of Africa region is on track for a fifth consecutive failed rainy season. A famine in 2011 in Somalia claimed more than a quarter of a million lives, most of them children. Peruvian lawmakers ousted the head of Congress just a day after the country's prime minister publicly demanded her removal after a result of leaked audio that showed her discussing how to use the legislature to benefit her party. The lawmaker had been in the role for less than two months, and her ouster underscores how the administration of the current president is pushing back against a Congress that impeached him twice. Political turmoil in Peru has become the norm with Peruvians living under five different presidents since 2016. You ever feel the urge to check your phone or do you ever fall down a rabbit hole for hours on Facebook, Twitter or YouTube? Well, there just might be a reason for it. New York Times international reporter Max Fisher takes us on a deep dive into how social media giants are changing the way we think, act, and process information across the globe. After years of international reporting, Fisher's new book, The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world, is out today. Well, congratulations, Max, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you talk about how social media platforms have really mm -hmm. spent a lot of time focusing on making sure that we we stay wired and connected mm -hmm. in an effort to make sure that they keep making a lot of money. Explain the algorithm basically behind okay. that. So when you open up a social media platform, what you think you are seeing are posts, thoughts, and sentiment from people in your community, from your friends, and you think when you interact with them, when you post something and get a response, what you are seeing is the feedback from your community and what they like and don't like. And that is not the case. What you are actually seeing, what you actually are experiencing are uh, emotions and sentiments and interactions that have been predetermined and pre-selected, often personalized just for you by these incredibly sophisticated artificial intelligence systems that govern the platforms that have determined the precise sorts of emotions, interactions, and sequence of sentiments that will get you not just to spend more time browsing and scrolling on social platforms, but will get you engaged yourself and will solicit specific reactions from you. And because we're talking about billions of people, the overwhelming majority of Americans, for instance, that has profound consequences for the way our society works and for our politics. You use the word consequences a few times there. I, yeah. I'm really curious what you see as social media's real world consequences. There's this one experiment that I write about in the book where these researchers took two really big groups of people over four weeks and half of them they said just live your life as normal and half of them they said deactivate your Facebook account, take it off your phone for them. And the consequences were staggering, I think. There were, one thing they found is that people who deactivated Facebook reported higher levels of happiness and life satisfaction equivalent to about a third the effect of going to therapy which is certainly a lot cheaper than going to therapy. And is also a suggestion that um, 
people weren't using social media because it makes them happy. In fact, they were using it because they are addicted to it oh. and had a hard time turning it off and needed this experiment to force them to turn it off. And another change they found was that people who deactivated it became significantly less polarized. The way that they saw the news, the way that they saw other people in their community. Do you have a social media account? You know, this is the thing that is tough about social media is that it is so dominant in our world, in the way that we consume information, in the way that we interact with people in our lives, their family and friends, that you kind of have to be on it. You probably have to have a smartphone. You probably have to be on social media to some extent. But the number one thing I think you can do is to understand what it's doing to you, understand its effects, understand the way that it distorts what it shows you and the way that people in your community seem to be acting. It's designed to be engaging. But the types of interactions that are engaging, that really um, activate certain chemicals in your brain and that make you want to spend more time on it are uh, conflict, fear, uh, moral, excuse me, moral outrage is by far the most engaging sentiment, uh, and also any sense of hostility towards people who are not in your social in-group. just want to take a look at the subtitle because you say the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world. Is that accurate? Has social media really <laughs> rewired our brains? They have indeed found that your actual brain chemistry is changed as a result of social media use. And there are actually there are a lot of things in our lives that change our brain chemistry, and they're called drugs. Uh, and that can be caffeine, that might be alcohol, it might be recreational drugs, it uh, might be cigarettes. And social media functions in very much the same way. And the reason that it's designed like that, and it's explicitly designed like that, the people who designed the platforms knowingly used um, slot machines, dopamine delivery, these addictive, physically addictive uh, features to get people to spend more time on there is that it also changes your behavior and changes the way that you think in all sorts of ways that we're not intentional on the part of the platforms, but are certainly consequential. Did you also talk about the 2020 election, right. uh, January 6th insurrection, that there yeah. was so much misinformation out there and that social media companies did very little to try to tamp that down. Do you feel like the genie is out of the bottle at this point or are they able to control misinformation? So it's funny, there's a lot of people who work at the big social media companies whose job is to reduce misinformation, is to reduce extremism on platforms, is to reduce uh, recruitment for extremist, far-right terrorist groups, but they are fighting a losing, and in many senses, unwinnable battle, not because there's something about social media that means that misinformation and hate are going to always be on there, but because these platforms are deliberately designed to ramp up engagement in the most ruthless possible ways that these companies can come up with. So it's out of the bottle in the sense that you can't clean it up as long as the companies are doing that, but it's also, at least in theory, relatively easy to fix because all the companies have to do is turn off these engagement maximizing features and a lot of this problem goes away, but they're not gonna do that. Based on the people that you interviewed who are both still inside the system and, and who've left, mm -hmm. is there a sense that, that you can kind of turn this around and, and use social media as a force for good? A lot of these people who I've talked to who are, some, some of them are dissidents in Silicon Valley or people who are, um, whistleblowers, some of them are researchers who are outside of the Silicon Valley, a lot of them are still true believers in the theoretical potential of a more neutral social media that does not have these engagement maximizing features is something that can be, and sometimes really is, a really dramatic and uh, major force for good in the world. But the problem is just these engagement maximizing features are just overpowering that good and creating a lot of harm in the world. Last quick, quick question, would you let a child of yours have social media? Oh my God, no. I wouldn't let myself have social media if I could get myself <laughs> off of it. What age, uh, 65? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, uh, maybe up to 16, 17. The pro I mean, the thing is that it's not just that um, there's a lot of harmful things on social media, but young kids and adolescents especially have a very exaggerated social need, and that means they spend a lot more time on social media. They're some of the best customers of these platforms, in fact, and it also means that the effects, the thing that affect you and me, affect them much more drastically. Mm. Max Fisher, we thank you so much. And to our viewers, you can purchase The Chaos Machine, the inside story of how social media rewired our minds and our world anywhere books are sold.
Really eye-opening stuff there. Still to come, after 50 years of making hot summer a little sweeter, is put it away his ice cream cart. How the fudgy wudgy man became such a beloved part of one beach's culture. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award winning, powerful, eye opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Finally tonight, to beachgoers in Wildwood, New Jersey, he is as iconic as the ocean waves and sandy shores. A longtime staple on the boardwalk there is sidelining his ice cream cart and is ready for retirement. Our partner station, WPVI in Philadelphia, introduces us to the veteran who has made his mark on generations of families. Wudgy wudgy ice cream! All of the guys who are in North Wildwood right now can tell you the same story. Orange cream sickles. They walk down the beach and they see people that they have known for 30 years or 40 years, or in my case, 50 years, and their grandchildren are now eating my ice cream. On cookies and cream, coming up. When I first heard about this job, oh, thank you. I was told that if you live here, Bomb pops. and you are a veteran, then you're eligible to apply for one of these licenses. Thank you. And that excited me because I always thought it was a cool job. Ice cream! Started in 1973. And I tell you what, I found a great deal of joy being out here and meeting people and talking with them. Thank All right, you, thank sir. You. I can't even believe you're going to retire. Actually. I can't believe it. I don't either. think it's actually going to no. happen. That's Uncle Dunk, baby. Living legend. Thank you. Thank Have you very a good much. Day. Sunshine to you. You come to the beach, what do you expect? Ice cream in a cup. When I hear that voice, it just really brings back all the memories from when I was a kid. He used to have a blue bathing suit with red sailboats, right? I would think so. <laughs> We're all happy that the city was allowed us to be here, and we hope that they continue. Thank you. To allow veterans to come in and replace us. Da, 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 da. Well, I'm 79, and it's my uh, last year selling ice cream on the beach. It's my time to move on. I'm going to miss it myself. We'll see. I may come down here incognito one day. <laughs> Unk Dunk, we thank him for his service. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news. 